We're ready then? Okay. So we're looking at chapter eight. Chapter eight, we're still talking about individuals, but chapter eight is also applicable to other entities. Part of chapter eight also deals with how individuals report their flow through income from um, other entities such as uh, partnerships and S corporations. So we're gonna take a look at that as well. So, but the main topic of chapter eight is rental property. Okay. So rental property uh, could be residential and non-residential. And we report the activity from rental property on schedule E um, and uh, the, the expenses that we can deduct is just like our schedule C trade or business, which are ordinary unnecessary expenses to um, manage our rental property. So we have, uh, this is actually schedule E has two pages. Page one is the rental and royalty income. And then page two is the flow through uh, entity income. So you can see um, it has, uh, you know, you have the ability to report different um, rental properties. Okay, if you have more than one, more pages could be added to this. You have to designate what type of property this is. Uh, if it's, you know, a commercial property, vacation home, uh, it could be a single family home, could be a condominium, etc. Okay, and you have, uh, you know, the, the different columns pertain to the properties that you have listed in uh, part one. And then you have a list of uh, different expenses that are common for rental properties. But you can always add, uh, you can see line 19, you can add a listing of other expenses if you can find it in the list here. We're also allowed tax depreciation. You guys have uh, learned in the previous chapter um, the depreciation for uh, real property and uh, commercial and non-commercial property. All right. Uh, so and then we uh, kind of take a summary of uh, the income and losses from the different properties. And this is what's going to flow into our form or schedule one and then form 1040. So we said we can deduct ordinary and necessary expenses in this rental activity. Uh, so examples of common rental activity expenses are advertising, repairs and maintenance, uh, management fees and depreciation. So real property is depreciated using the straight line depreciation. This is from the uh, tables. If you remember makers tables, the 27 and a half and the 39 years. Uh, so we we'll use those to uh, depreciate the rental property. Land is not depreciable. So if we have like a single family home and uh, we have you know a yard, then we're going to have to do an allocation between the cost, uh, the total cost and the cost allocated to the building itself and the land because land is not depreciable. So we're only going to depreciate the building. OK, so that's something we need to keep in mind. If, uh, for example, we are uh, realtors, OK, so we are in the business of, uh, you know, um, we treat this as a, a trade or business, all right? So this is, we dedicate our whole time to uh, maybe the management of rental property, of our rental property. And so in that case, instead of listing it on Schedule E, we're gonna uh, list it on Schedule C, okay? So uh, the taxpayer has to materially participate uh, this is a certain amount of hours that they need to spend on this activity to be considered a trade or business and what that means too is that if it's considered a trade or business it's going to be subject to self-employment tax 
while as a rental property on Schedule E, it is not. Okay, so that's something that we need to keep in mind because rental rental activities are considered passive. Okay, they are considered passive income unless we are um, this is our trader business. But if not, that this is let's say I have a property that I inherited from, I don't know, some family member, and I decide to rent that property, but I have a full-time job somewhere else doing something else, then that rental property is passive activity for me, right? I'm not really dedicating uh, the time to it. This is just like a side investment. So it's a passive activity. And we're gonna see that uh, passive income or, or passive losses are limited. Okay, so the designation of passive is important because once the activity is designated as passive, then we're limited as to the amount of losses that we can deduct. So usually passive losses are limited to passive income. So as long as we have income, we can offset the loss. If not, the loss will carry over. All right. Uh, so if we have received, um, I don't know, um, personal property or services in exchange for rent, we still have to report that as rental income. Okay. Uh, so for example, Brady owns a rental property that he rents to his friend Jack for 800 per month. In November, Jack repairs a leaky roof for um, of the rental property for four fifty, and pays Brady three fifty for rent. So, Brady still have to report that rental income of eight hundred. So this um, repairs that Jack did, the fair market value of that will be considered rent. Okay, received, and so he has to pay taxes on that. Uh, now, things get a bit more complicated when we are, uh, you know, kind of co-sharing this property. So let's say that this is an extra property that we have and we may use it as a vacation home sometimes and sometimes when we're not there, we're going to rent it. Okay. So when we have this split between personal and rental, we're going to have to decide exactly how we're going to treat this property. Is it primarily rental, primarily personal, or personal and rental? Okay, so that's um, what we need to find out. So those are the three categories. Okay, so for example, actually, let me just move into the next one. Uh, so personal use is uh, mainly used for the taxpayer, okay? Even if they have a, a family member that's uh, living there and it's paying rent at fair market value, we'll still consider it personal, okay? That will not qualify it as a rental property. So in making that determination, if it's uh, primarily rental, uh, we have to use it uh, no more than 14 days for personal purposes or 10% of the total rental days, whichever is greater. So as long as we meet the less than 14 days, then the property will be considered primarily rental property. And then all the income and expenses of the rental property will be reported on Schedule E. Um, the expenses must be allocated depending on the amount of days that we were there. We may have to allocate between personal and rental use. Um, and something to keep into consideration, we said that rental activities are passive and that their losses are limited to passive income. However, if our adjusted gross income is 100000 or less, uh, we allowed or the tax law allows a deduction of up to $25,000 of passive loss for from rental activities. Okay, 
So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, primarily rental homes. So Mandy rented her home in Laguna Beach, California for 190 days for 36,000 and she used it for uh, 17 days. Okay, so even though she used it for um, more than 14 days, um, it's either 14 days or 10% of the days that were rented, whichever is greater right? Uh, no more than 14 days or 10% of rental days. So in this case, 10% of 190 days is 19 days. Okay. So this is primarily rental property. A uh, home that is rented for less than 15 days, uh, but otherwise used as personal residence is primarily personal. Okay. So less than 15 days is primarily personal. And that means that uh, we don't have to, if it's designated as primarily personal, we don't have to report the income from uh, the rent. We don't have to deduct, or we are not allowed to deduct the expenses, uh, except for, of course, if we're itemizing mortgage interest and property taxes from this vacation home will be deductible. So Maya rented her cabin in Big Bear for 2,000 for 10 days over the holidays, and she and her family used it for the rest of the year. So it's primarily personal, right? It was rented for less than 15 days. Actually, this should say 15 days, no, 14 days, okay? It was rented for less than 15 days, therefore, they don't have to report the 2000 and they don't get to deduct any uh, rental expenses. Now, it could be a combination or both, okay? It could be personal and rental at the same time. Uh, a situation where uh, the rental property that is used for more than 14 days for personal purposes or 10% uh, of rental days and rented for 15 days or more is considered personal rental property. So all income and expenses will be reported in Schedule E, but we're gonna have to allocate the expenses between personal and rental use, okay? Uh, so we're gonna have to do an allocation and there's different ways to, actually two methods to do the allocation. So we're gonna look at that uh, in just a few minutes. For example, Adriana rented her lake house for 90 days for 13,500 and she and her family used it for 50 days. So it was rented for more than 15 days and it was used for personal use more than 14 days. So that means that it's both personal and rental. So Darren rented a house uh, at the lake for 48 days, so more than 15 days, for 9,000 and stayed there on weekends with his family for a total of 18 days. During his stay, he worked to replace the roof for, his, for six days while his family went out on the boat and fished. So the fact that he was there uh, replacing the roof, okay, uh, that is going to be deducted from his personal use. So it's not like he strictly went there just to use the property, but he went there to repair the property. And so his personal days are going to be 12 days, which is less than the 14 days, right? It's less than 14 days, which makes this uh, property primarily rental okay it makes it primarily rental because he didn't he's considered not to have lived there uh, or used the property for personal use no more than 14 days so that makes it primarily rental Uh, rental expenses must be, when it's personal rental or primarily rental, we're going to have to allocate the expenses, okay? 
based on the amount of days that was rented. And there's two methods to do that, the IRS method and the tax court method. Now, when it comes to the IRS method, we're using the ratio of total number of days, personal and rental, and we're considering the rental use divided by the total number of days used, okay? Uh, we do that for all the expenses, including mortgage interest and property taxes. When it comes to the tax court method, in, uh, the everything else we use the same as the IRS method, except for mortgage interest and taxes, which we're gonna take the rental uh, period divided by 365 days. I think I have a couple of examples and then you'll see uh, in the assignments that are due that we are doing this allocation, this crazy allocation as well. So here we have an example. We're using the IRS method. Uh, we were given a list of expenses related to this rental property. Uh, the property was used 22 days for personal use, so more than 14 days, and it was rented for more than 15 days, so that makes it personal and rental property. Uh, so we are going to allocate the 84. So if I add uh, 84 plus 22, oops, I said 22 and I <laughs> put 11. Uh, so that makes it 108 total days used. Okay, total days used is 108. So we're going to take all of these expenses and we're going to multiply by 84. That's the number of days that was rented. Oh, it's 106, not 108. Divided by 106. Okay, and so we do the allocation. Now note that if I were to take 2,500 multiply by that fraction, 84 divided by 106. So 84 divided by 106 and multiply by, uh, what did we say? 2,500 of depreciation is actually 1,981. But uh, we cannot generate a loss, okay? So uh, because we are not renting it the whole entire year, this is just a, a proration of the days that was rented. So we cannot generate a loss. So we're going to have to plug the amount of depreciation enough to zero out our income, but not to create a loss, all right? So that's something that we need to keep in mind. It's kind of similar to the home office. I don't know if you remember the home office expense. We kind of had to do something similar with the depreciation where we couldn't generate a net loss on Schedule C. Therefore, we had to plug the amount of depreciation. So that's the same uh, logic here as well. Under the tax court method, we're using the same rate as we did with the IRS method for all of the expenses except for our mortgage interest and our property taxes. So with the IRS method, the ratio that we use for these two is going to be different than the tax court method. Here we're using the days that were rented divided by 365. And then whatever amounts of, uh, so here for mortgage interest, uh, we still have like another 900 or whatever, the same with property taxes. Um, under either method, the IRS method or the tax court method, that amount of mortgage interest and property taxes that is not deducted in Schedule E is going to be deducted in Schedule A if the taxpayer is itemizing. Any questions about the allocations? the allocation uh, methods. Okay. Um, is this part of, no, it's not part of our assignment. Okay, so let me see if we can, uh, we'll just leave it there. We'll put a pin on that 
and we'll look at it again when we have to um, go over the assignment. So we have now royalty income. Uh, royalty income refers to uh, maybe you have created a song or uh, you know it could be from uh, a copyright it could be from a trademark or some you know uh, brand name that you have created or stuff like that or it can also be from an oil well uh, that you are receiving royalty payments if that's the case this is also reported on Schedule E, and you can deduct any expenses related to that on that schedule. If it's a trade or business, so you're kind of doing this full time, then it will be reported on Schedule C, subject to self-employment tax. So royalty income, okay, so we mentioned that. And it provides some examples of royalty income. Okay. And then we come to flow through entities. So does anybody know what flow through entities are? You can either say yes or no. Okay. So a, a flow through entity is when... Uh, let's say, for example, that uh, all the people in this class have decided to open a restaurant and we are going to form a partnership, okay? Uh, so let's say that uh, how many of us? Ten of us, okay? We have a partnership with, with uh, ten partners, all right? Now let's say that the partnership... Uh, net profits for the year were uh, $10,000, all right? So that means that each partner share of the net profits, if my, my um, math is correct, uh, will receive uh, $1,000 each, okay? So the partnership netted $10,000 net profit for the year, we have 10 partners, so the 10,000, we're going to distribute $1,000 each to each partner, each of our partners. So instead of the partnership paying taxes and then distributing that 1,000 to each partner and then the partners paying taxes on that, which is the double taxation that corporations are subject to, instead of doing that, the partnership doesn't pay any taxes, okay? There is no tax at the partnership level. Uh, only each partner will be taxed on their $1,000 uh, share of the profits, okay? So they're going to be taxed at their respective marginal tax rates, each partner. That's called a flow through entity. So the net income flows through to the partners. It jumps this entity that we have formed directly to the partners. Unlike a, a C corporation where the corporation has to pay taxes and then the after tax dividend is paid to the shareholders who are taxed again. Okay, so that's the double taxation if you ever heard of it. That's what we're referring to, flow through entities bypass that double taxation. So individuals are going to have to report the uh, income or losses uh, passed through to them uh, from these flow through entities in their individual form 1040, okay, uh, page two of schedule E, okay, page two of schedule E. And uh, flow through entities are eligible for the qualified business income, that 20% deduction. I remember that we touched on this when we were looking at the self employed individual. So, the same thing for flow through entities, all right? Uh, so, that's just a synopsis of flow through entities. 
limited liability companies are a different animal in that they can choose limited liability companies can choose how they want to be taxed they could choose to be taxed as a c corporation with a double taxation or they could choose to be taxed as a partnership okay so that is going to make a difference there All right, and how does the partner or S shareholder knows their uh, flow through income or losses? They're going to receive what is called a Schedule K-1 from the partnership or at the LLC. And then they're going to use the items that are listed in there to report on their Form 1040. Uh, so depending on the partner, um, depending on the type of income that is shown there, then the, that income will flow into the Schedule B, Schedule D, Schedule E of the shareholder or the partner's uh, returns. Okay. All right. And this has to do with the passive income and losses that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so that's just a review of that. Okay, so now we finally come to the assignments for this chapter. And of course, we're going to have this crazy rental activity. So here we have, uh, I'm not sure, is his name Kevin or Kelvin? Okay, Kelvin owns and lives in a duplex. He rents the other unit for 760 per month. He incurs the following expenses during the current year for the entire property. Okay, so this is for the entire property. So that means that some of these we're going to have to half, right? Between, uh, you know, if you know a duplex has two equal units, right? That are exactly the same, kind of like uh, twins. And so he is living on one of these and the other one he's renting. All right. So if if the expenses for the entire property, he's going to have to have uh, whatever is for the rent property, because that's going to be reported on Schedule E. Right. And then there's some expenses that could be reported on Schedule A if they are itemized. So that's what we're doing here. So one example of those, so we have the income. Uh, the income is 760 per month. So if we take 760 and we multiply by 12, that will be the income per month. Uh, and so that will be 9,120. So that will be only allocated to uh, the rental property. So rental schedule E. All right, that's rental schedule E. And this is going to be our schedule A. If any, if any. And some will not be allowed either as schedule A or schedule E, OK? So we're going to put here this allowed. All right, so we have the income. We got the mortgage interest. We can split it in half. All right, so half can go to Schedule A. Uh, that's 3775 The other half can go as our uh, part of our rental expenses okay we also have property taxes which we will have to split in half as well so real property taxes half of 1020 it's on schedule a the other half can be deducted as a rental expense uh, we have utilities, okay, utilities are not a Schedule A expense. So half of the utilities can be 
deducted as a rent and the other half will be disallowed as an expense all right uh, we have fixed life fixture in rental units so that's specifically that's a direct expense that will be uh, located all to the rental we don't have to have that Uh, dishwasher in personal unit that will not be deductible, right? Uh, so we can't deduct this expense that will be disallowed. Uh, we painted the exterior paint of the entire duplex, right? So only half of this we can deduct as part of our rental expenses uh, the other half will be disallowed because it's considered personal uh, we have the insurance again insurance we can split but insurance is not uh, an itemized deduction so that means that uh, 1000 is rental expense the other 1000 we don't do anything with and last is the depreciation so half this is entire structure i don't know why you would depreciate personal side of the duplex but i guess so you, that means that you'll have to take half of this you can only deduct half i'm trying to move this up a bit but it won't let me so we're going to have half of the depreciation uh, is 3250 So half will be deducted on Schedule E, and then the other half will be disallowed, right? So that's just uh, rental property. So I have to complete a Schedule E for the rental only for Schedule A, these two expenses will be deductible and everything else is considered personal and not deductible. All right. Uh, here we are talking about the tax court allocation uh, for a property that is both uh, rental and um, also personal okay let me just see because i think we have one that covers both we this is tax court again this is tax court allocation and irs method okay let's do this one it has both methods so in that way you guys can see the difference between the two methods. So this is when we have where is personal and rental at the same time. So uh, they uh, occupy the rental property. So personal use is uh, greater than 14 days and rental is greater than 15 days. So that makes it personal slash rental. Okay, it makes it both. All right, so it looks like our income is going to be the 88 days that was rented multiplied by 159. Maybe this is like an Airbnb, although 88 days for Airbnb seems kind of long. But um, And so 13,192 is the rental income for that, right? Uh, this is Randolph. Okay, so that's our rental income. So now we need to allocate. Okay, we need to allocate the uh, rent uh, using the tax court allocation. So for tax court allocation, that means that for the mortgage interest and the property taxes, we are going to use, so let me do it here. 
we're going to use uh, over 365 days, right? So we have mortgage interest. It's going to be 4,680 um, multiplied by 88 divided by 365. Okay. So that's for the mortgage interest. And then the property taxes is going to be 1,290 multiplied by 88 over 365. And then all the other expenses, all the other expenses, and maybe I can just add it uh, all up, um, but I don't know if they're going to end up with loss. But all the other expenses, we're going to use the 88 divided by 88 plus 45. So the total used, right? Personal and rental. Um, we're going to use that rate for all the other expenses. So if I take the insurance, the utilities, the repairs, and the depreciation, get a total, and then multiply it by this ratio. Okay, let's see if that works. So I have uh, 1935. Plus twenty four thirty five plus fifteen forty five plus sixty six eighty is twelve thousand five ninety five. Okay, and then multiply by eighty eight divided by one thirty three. Right. So that is going to be. I have 8,334, okay? And then I still have to get a total for this. Uh, I have 1,128. And then I have $311, okay? So if I... We're to take our 13,992 less 8,334 minus 1128 minus 311. That equals 4,219. 4,219 is our net rental income. Okay, and all these will be reported on the Schedule E. So compare that to if we were using the IRS method allocation, which is just using uh, this rate. Okay, the 88 over 133, that's the IRS method for all of the expenses. So basically, we can add all of the expenses so I get, let's see, and feel free to jump in if you already have a total for these. Okay, I got 18,565. I hope that's right. And then we're going to multiply by 88 divided by 133. We said that's the IRS method. And I'm getting 12,000. 283 of rental expenses and we said the income was 13,992 
minus 12,283. I have 1,708 of net rental income. All right. So if I were uh, a taxpayer, I want to pay the least amount of taxes. Uh, this, the um, IRS allocation method seems to work best for me because my net rental income under this method is only 1,708. With the tax court method, it was 4,219. That means I'm gonna pay more taxes. Unless I have rental losses from other entities, other properties that I own, uh, then uh, the other method seems to be in this case, more advantageous from a taxpayer's perspective. Okay. So I don't know, is that, oh yeah, I think that was the question, right? Question C. So IRS method will be the answer for that. All right, now we start looking at these uh, pass-through activities and how is the taxpayer is going to report that on their individual income tax returns. And we said these are reported on Schedule K-1 of a partnership, of an LLC, of an S corporation, and they are provided just like a W-2 to the partners, S shareholders, LLC members, so that they can report these items in their individual income tax returns. All right, so where are they gonna report these items? I think that's the question. And the Schedule K-1 uh, kind of breaks that down into different uh, characters for uh, portfolio income, for uh, maybe um, 1231 business property, uh, gains and losses, etc. Because as we know, uh, certain uh, itemized deductions and certain um, capital gains, long-term capital gains and qualified dividends and things like that are going to be taxed at preferential tax rates at the individual side. And so for that reason, the Schedule K-1 uh, provides that uh, breakdown. So let me see if I can find... Um, I'm not sure if your book has a picture of the Schedule K-1, but I kind of wanted to show you that so that you have an idea. Okay, so this is the Schedule K-1. Can you guys see this? We can, see it. we can see it. Thank you. Okay, so this is from a partnership. Okay, partnerships uh, have to complete. Just because they don't pay taxes doesn't mean that they still don't filing uh, tax returns. So they still these entities, these flow through entities, will file tax returns. It's just that they're not paying any taxes, and so they are going to distribute this uh, Schedule K one to each partner. Okay. And it will have uh, the partnership's name, and then it will have the partner's social security, the partner's um, address, and their profit and loss percentages and capital percentages. And then on the income losses side, it just divides everything. So you have ordinary uh, income and losses from the partnership. If the partnership had any rental income or losses, they're gonna list it separately. If the um, partnership had interest income, it's gonna be listed separately. Qualified dividends are listed separately. Uh, Short-term and long-term capital gains and losses are also uh, separated, section 171, uh, 179, et cetera. Those items, if there were any charitable contributions, those will also be uh, separately stated. In addition to that, partners partners are uh, like self uh, like sole proprietors, right? Except that you have a group of them. You need two or more 
to form a partnership. So that's like sole proprietors. Sole proprietors cannot pay themselves. They cannot have a W-2. They cannot pay themselves. Uh, if they're going to take money out of the business, that is a draw, right? That's a withdrawal. So the same thing with partners. However, we may have, and we're going to see more of this when we look at the partnership, but if the partnership has um, like a, a general manager, uh, a partner who is in charge of managing the business, and the other partners are passive, they're not doing anything, other than getting the income returns from the partnership, uh, that partner that is being put in charge as manager, he's going to get paid, he or she will get paid, but instead of getting paid a salary, these are payments are designated as guaranteed payments, okay, and they're subject to self-employment tax. So if this partner received guarantee payments, those will be listed here, okay, so thus, I just wanted to kind of show you what the K-1 was about to make that topic a bit more tangible. So in this regard, um, I think they want us to calculate uh, where each uh, partner will be reporting uh, the flow through income from this partnership. Okay. Uh, so we have Mabel, Loretta, and Margaret are equal partners in a local restaurant. The restaurant reports the following items for the current year. Okay, so this revenue minus the business expenses is going to be our ordinary income or loss. And we saw that listed on the Schedule K-1. So uh, 560 minus 290 is 270000 so this is going to be in ordinary income, okay? Ordinary income is from revenues minus expenses. And then listed separately, also from the partnership, are investment expenses, short-term capital gains and losses, all right? So these uh, items, these three items, these three um, bag of items, <laughs> These three categories of items will be split evenly. Uh, they didn't really give us, oh yeah, they own one third each. So that means we're gonna have to spread this evenly among the three shareholders. Um, so if uh, how much each individual report these results on her form 1040, okay? Uh, I'm not sure if it gives you the schedules or not, um, but we can say that uh, one third, okay, so one third of the ordinary income or loss is going to be reported in Schedule E, okay, Schedule E, I don't know if we ask you the page, but uh, Schedule E, page two, we will report uh, each partner's share of on each partner's return uh, there of the ordinary income. And then we have the investment expenses. Uh, if you recall, net investment expenses um, are reported on Schedule A. If we are itemizing, uh, right? And um, net investment expenses are um, limited to net investment income. But in this regard, I don't think they're asking us to limit that. So we're just going to take the 156 and then divide it by 3. So that should be 52. And this goes to Schedule A. All right. And for the capital gains and losses, we are going to net these right, to see what do we come up with. It looks like we have a net loss. So 156 minus 211, 200 is 55, 200. And then we got to split this in three. So each partner is going to report 
18,400 in losses. So this will go to Schedule D. Now remember that individuals are limited to what amount in terms of capital losses? Does anybody recall? What is the limit for capital losses for individuals? Three thousand, correct. So we the the each of these partners, if they don't have any other uh, gain from anywhere else, uh, capital gain, then they will be limited to a three thousand dollar loss, and the remaining um, fifteen thousand four hundred will carry over to the following year. Okay, so that's that. Uh, this is similar to what we just did, right? The revenues minus the expenses is the ordinary income. So we need to take one third of that, and that's reported in Schedule E. Uh, the corporation also earned 12000 in taxable dividends and dividend income. So that's going to be split to, uh, oh, I see. Uh, these two shareholders are married. They are S shareholders. Okay, so that means that we don't need to split it in two because they're married finally jointly. So 100% of the ordinary income will be reported on Schedule E. Uh, the 12,000 taxable dividend and interest will be reported in Schedule B. And then our 8,400 in investment interest expenses will be reported on Schedule A. Okay. So that was that. Um, Dominic and Terrell are joint owners of a bookstore. The business operates as an S corporation. Dominic owns 65%. Terrell owns 35%. The business has the following results in the current year okay so this is same thing uh these items this will be our ordinary income except that we have to multiply this by 65 percent to dominic and 35 percent to terrell right so let's just do this as an example um so this is 420 of ordinary income so multiply by 65 percent uh, Dominic is 273,000 that's his share and Terrell's share is 35 percent so 273 147 all right so this was Dominic And this is Terrell. And as we know, this ordinary income, or as I mentioned it before, is going to go to their Schedule E. All right. Charitable contributions, again, you're going to have to split it uh, 65, 35, and that will go to Schedule A. Uh, our capital gains and losses, um, you don't net them. You don't net them because they are different types of capital losses and gains. So you're going to have to report this individually on the Schedule K-1. You need this breakdown. So 65% uh, to Dominic, 35% to Terrell. And then you do the same with the long-term capital gain as well. So that's, and, and as we know, capital gains and losses is a Schedule D. All right, I think this has to do with uh, the one where you have to do the um, 
uh, tax return. And I think I just wanted to clarify that you don't have to do any allocation for the rent. Uh, all the items that are listed here are reported on uh, the Schedule E. The only item that we are not going to report in Schedule E is the state sales tax. Okay, But all the other items are reported on Schedule E. You don't have to prorate anything. And then the net rental income, uh, you can get the 20%, you can claim the 20% QBI deduction on Form 8995. Uh, so that's for... Uh, the tax return that is due with this chapter. Are there any questions for chapter eight before I move on to chapter nine? Okay, so for chapter nine, I just wanted to introduce the chapter. We're going to do uh, the exercises on uh next week okay because remember that we don't have class um on thursday okay we don't have class on thursday so chapter nine is about uh tax credits okay uh if you remember on page two of form 1040 we can claim tax credits tax credits are more beneficial than tax deductions because tax deductions uh, are you know uh, subject still to the marginal tax rate? So depending on what marginal tax rate you are, then that's gonna limit the benefit of a deduction. While a tax credit is a one-to-one -one deduction from your tax. So if you owe a thousand dollars and you have a child tax credit, for example, you can reduce that to zero, right? Uh, so, and you pay no taxes. So the tax credit is more beneficial. So we have different types of tax credits. Uh, some you may or may not be familiar with. I think one of the ones that um, uh, people may be familiar with is the child and dependent care expense credit. Uh, this is if you have a child who's uh, 13 years of age or younger or under 13 actually. Yeah, under 13, uh, then if you, you know, you're working or you're a full-time student and you need to, uh, someone is caring for that child um, and they're getting paid for it, then you can claim this deduction, all right? So it's available for working parents. Uh, there is a limit on the amount of the deduction. Um, I believe it's 3000 per child. Uh, maybe they're going to name it here. And so uh, you take a percentage of your adjusted gross income. The percentage goes from 20% to 35% of the taxpayer AGI. That's the amount of the credit. As I said before, the limit on the expense is $3,000 per child to a maximum of 6000 for two or more children. Um, and like we said before, it has to be earned income or uh, maybe you have a, um, a parent who is a full-time student, all right? It can also be for an adult uh, that you are caring for. Um, maybe it's someone who is disabled or maybe it's an elderly person that needs, you know, 24-hour care. Then you can also take uh, the credit for uh, these individuals, all right? And here is uh, the spread of uh, the percentages based on the adjusted gross income. Uh, the higher the income, the um, less the percentage for the credit, okay? So those uh, folks who have a lower AGI get a greater percentage of a tax credit that they can take. So here we have an example. Jamie is a single mother with one dependent child, Joey, age seven. She has AGI of 75,000 and she paid 4,500 to qualify daycare center. So remember, that's only 3,000, the amount that is allowed. 
Her AGI exceeds the 43,000. So her, uh, her uh, credit is limited to 20% of the maximum allowed, which is 3,000. So even though she paid 4,500, she can only claim 3,000. So the amount of the dependent uh, care uh, credit is $600. Uh, Tom and Katie are married, filed a joint return, and have two dependent children, Jack, age 11, and Jill, age 5. Tom has earned income of 41000 Katie was a full-time student. Uh, they paid a qualified daycare after-school care center, $6,000. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, what is the maximum amount of the qualified employment-related expenses that would be allowed for the child and dependent care credit calculation for Tom and, and Katie? Because the uh, spouse, the spouse is not employed full time. Uh, she is a full time student, all right. Uh, she was full time student for nine months. So if she was a full time student, she's only allowed. $500 per month for the times that she attended school. And so the maximum uh, dependent care credit that they can take is not based on the table, but it's based on this calculation, uh, and it will be $4,500. Okay. Um, well, we'll pass this same. Uh, we have another credit for the elderly or disabled as well. Uh, so credit is available for taxpayers who are over 65 years of age and they are permanently or totally disabled. Uh, the credit is equal to 15% of allowable base amounts depending on their filing status and the number of qualifying persons. So the amount of the base amounts are 5,000 for single taxpayers, uh, 7,500 for joint returns, and 3,750 for Mary finally separately. So for example, Joey and, and Sue, or Joe and Sue are married and file a joint return and are age 70 and 60 years old respectively. They have AGI of 12,000 and receive non-taxable social security benefits of 1,500. So in calculating the base amount, we are deducting the non-taxable social security. And then uh, we subtract less than the AGI over uh, 10,000. So 10,000 is the threshold for Mary finally jointly. So in order to get this elderly and disabled credit, um, they have to have a very small amount of adjusted gross income, okay? And so we subtract half of the amount that exceeded the 10,000. So 12,000 uh, minus 10,000 is 2,000 divided by, by 2 is 1,000, and we come out to the allowable base amount. And... Um, uh, that that percentage uh, is going to give us the amount of the credit. Okay. Uh, so we do the same for Vincent and Maria. Same calculation as we did before. And uh, then we also have the education credit. The education credit, it will be beneficial for students like you, right? So if uh, you are uh, paying for tuition, so this is net of any scholarships, right? So after you have received any scholarships, you still had to pay, then you can look at the education credit, uh, especially the American Opportunity Tax Credit, which is refundable. So some of these credits are refundable, some are not. Most of them are not, except for the American Opportunity Tax Credit, uh, the Child Tax Credit, and the Earned Income Credit. Uh, so for education credits, we have two, the American Opportunity Tax Credit and the Lifetime uh, Learning Credit. 
and you have to, in order to claim these credits, you have to file Form 8863. So qualifying expenses allowable for this credit are tuition fees and books. We cannot claim room and board, okay? And it has to be from a uh, accredited institution. All right. So the maximum amount of the um, American Opportunity Tax Credit is twenty five hundred. Okay. So a hundred percent of the first two thousand and twenty five percent of the next two thousand is twenty five hundred. Um, you also have to be in a, a four year bachelor's degree. Uh, but if you, for example, uh, you're uh, in a master program or, uh, you know, you are uh, doing any other type of education, then the lifetime learning credit, uh, you can take advantage of that. And that is 20% of qualifying expenses for a maximum of 2000 per year. The credit under the lifetime credit is 2000 per year. Okay, there is a adjusted gross income limitation for the American Opportunity Tax Credit. So once that we exceed that AGI, it's uh, phased out and we cannot take advantage of this credit. The same thing with the lifetime learning credit. So you cannot claim both credits. You have to uh, choose which one you are eligible to claim and probably most uh, advantageous. So here's an example. Jules is a single taxpayer and paid uh, $2,900 in qualifying expenses for her dependent daughter who attended uh, the university. So we take $2,000. She's going to claim the lifetime learning credit to $2,900 multiplied by 20% is $580. That's the maximum amount of the credit. Okay, and let's see, so this is all education. We also have a foreign tax credit. I think we kind of talked about this when we were looking at the itemized deductions on Schedule A, uh, but the foreign tax credit, uh, we can take a credit for taxes that we pay to other countries. Income taxes, they can be taken in uh, your U.S. income tax return or Guam income tax return because we have to report worldwide income. So we have to even report income that we made outside Guam, outside the United States. And so we can claim uh, foreign tax credit for foreign taxes paid. Okay, there is a little formula for that where you take uh, the foreign source taxable income divided by the worldwide taxable income and then multiply by the income tax. So you may not get a credit for the full amount of taxes paid to a foreign country because we have to apply, we have to apply this ratio. Okay, so foreign tax and then of course child tax credit. This is probably the one that you guys are most familiar with. Uh, which is uh, $2,000 uh, per child. Uh, you're also allowed uh, $500 for qualifying relatives. Uh, so there are some uh, or qualifying dependents. So once, because the um, child tax credit is only for children under 17. So you may have, um, a taxpayer may have, uh, for example, you guys, right? Someone who is um, over 17, but they're still the dependent, and so they can claim this $500 credit instead, okay, as long as they meet all the other requirements. There is an AGI limitation, uh, and then after that, uh, it's reduced $50, $50 per $1,000 in excess of the threshold. I'm going kind of fast because our uh, class will end soon and I kind of want to cover this. Uh, retirement savings contributions credit, we also have that. 
uh, it gives you a credit if you are saving for retirement but the AGI uh, there's some AGI requirements for that uh, we can see the percentages that were allowed for the credit and then the AGI so once we exceed the AGI we no longer qualify for the retirement savings contribution Uh, there's also an adoption credit, so if taxpayers have adopted a child, uh, they are allowed to take a credit for some of the expenses. You know, it can be quite expensive uh, to adopt a child, uh, and so uh, this is kind of, you know, helps out those taxpayers that are adopting. And then, as we said, we have, and you guys may be familiar with, the earned income credit right is a refundable tax credit uh, that means that even if tax is zero tax due is zero then the taxpayer can still get money from the earned income credit uh, this is for uh, of course is earned income so that means the taxpayer must have earned income okay uh, and they also have to have um, well they don't have to but if depending on the amount of children that they have, uh, the amount of the credit uh, will increase. And this is for a mainly low income uh, taxpayers. And again, it's a refundable credit. Uh, oh, I forgot the premium tax credit. Uh, this is mainly for uh, the mainland. It doesn't. It's not really applicable to Guam, but in the mainland, individuals are required to have health insurance. And um, if a taxpayer purchases insurance through the marketplace, this is based on the Obama Care. Uh, the premium tax credit may be available. They can take a credit against that premium that they are paying. This is just to make sure that individuals are insured right okay so i think that's that pretty much complete